This morning, turn with me in your Bibles to Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10, verses 1 through 20. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them on ahead of him, two by two, into every town and place where he himself was about to go. <clears throat> and he said to them, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Go your way. Behold, I am sending you out as lambs in the midst of wolves. Carry no money bag, no knapsack, no sandals, and greet no one on the road. Whatever house you enter, first say, Peace be to this house. And if a son of peace is there, your peace will rest upon him. But if not, it will return to you. And remain in the same house, eating and drinking what they provide, for the laborer deserves his wages. Do not go from house to house. Whenever you, whenever you enter a town and they receive you, eat what is set before you. Heal the sick in it and say to them, The kingdom of God has come near to you. But whenever you enter a town and they do not receive you, go into its streets and say, Even the dust of your town that clings to our feet we wipe off against you. Nevertheless, know this, that the kingdom of God has come near. I tell you, it will be more bearable on that day for Sodom than for that town. Woe to you, Chorazin! Woe to you, Bethsaida! For if the mighty works done in you had, be done, had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. But it will be more bearable in the judgment for Tyre and Sidon than for you. And you, Capernaum, will you be exalted to heaven? You shall be brought down to Hades. The one who hears you hears me, and the one who rejects you rejects me. And the one who rejects me rejects him who sent me. The 72 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. So far, the reading from God's word this morning, may he add its blessing to our hearts. Well, there are crazy people in this world. They run marathons. I don't know why anybody would subject themselves to any such kind of activity. But there is a history behind the development of this grueling running race, and it stems from Greek times where the Greek city of Athens was fighting a battle against the Persians at a place called Marathon. And as the Athenians were victorious over the Persian army, there was one soldier in particular, Phidippides or Philippides, depending on who you're reading. And he asked that he would be able to run and, and tell the good news of the victory of the Athenian army back in the city. And he was given permission to do so by his commanding officer. It was a, a great honor. And so this man ran 25 miles, the distance from Marathon to Athens. And he ran without stop to give the good news. And there's a, a painting that you can see of this man. He, he, he runs to the place where the government was sitting. And you see him lying on the ground in front of the governor, the ruler of the city, uttering the good news and then dying. The drama of the origin of running marathons. The picture of Phidippides or Philippides is not unlike the picture of the Christian disciple described here by our Lord Jesus Christ. Our Lord Jesus Christ speaking of the Christian disciple as one who goes out into the harvest to bring good news to another at the cost of of his own life in many instances. I think that's what uh, Jesus is teaching us. It's, he's teaching us about the labor in the vineyard, this labor in the vineyard that speaks of the declaring of the gospel, the good news to people. And Jesus, as he teaches this to his disciples, he shows them that this is uh, not only a dangerous work, it's not only an urgent work, but it is a work that is commanded by Christ and it is always used to bear fruit, either the fruit of rejection and judgment, 
or the fruit of repentance and salvation. It is a necessary fruit that I want us to concentrate on, not necessarily for other people. I don't want you to be thinking about your neighbors. I don't want you to be thinking about people in other denominations. I don't want you to be thinking about people who you know at work who blaspheme the Lord's name. I want us to be thinking about Cliffwood Presbyterian Church and our work in, as laborers in the vineyard and what kind of fruit that has been born in our hearts as a result of the ministry of Christ and His Spirit. Either we bear rotten fruit, we reject Christ, or we bear healthy fruit in the acceptance through the Spirit. Jesus teaches us uh, these things in three different parts of this passage. First, in verses 1 through 12, we see the command of Jesus to go out into the harvest. Second of all, we see Jesus mourning over the, those who would not repent according to the word of the uh, of the disciples and then we finally see jesus warning to the disciples as they return so we see jesus commands in verses 1 through 12 jesus mourns in verses 13 through 16 and then jesus warns in verses 17 through 20. let's begin by looking at what jesus commands we go to verse 1 and we see jesus appointing 72 others in some Manuscripts, it says 70. I don't want us to quibble over numbers. There are 72 of them here, according to the translators of uh, the ESV, and they are sent out two by two. 72 people sent out by Christ in anticipation of His visit to these different places. And their task was as laborers. It says, uh, that the harvest is plentiful in verse 2, but the laborers are few. They are identified as laborers. These laborers are going out into the harvest. The harvest is a, is a picture in Scripture repeatedly used for the sorting of souls. The sorting of souls into two categories. Uh, the righteous and the sinner. The redeemed and the unregenerate. And the laborers, these 72 disciples, are sent out into the harvest to be part of this sorting of souls. Their task is calling people, this calling and this sorting. It's a, it's a great task, but it says that the laborers are few. It impresses on us the great urgency of this work that, God, that Christ has sent them out to do. Now, this urgent task is to be performed by only 72 they are not the lords of the harvest, these 72. They are not the ones who will affect this harvest. They are only laborers in the harvest. They work for the Lord of the harvest. And so because it is not their harvest, because they are only laborers, Christ establishes in his charge this complete dependency of the disciples. It says in verse 2 that they are to pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest. They are to turn their attention not to what they can do, but they are to turn their attention to the Lord of the harvest. They are only workers. And this prayer is, of course, necessary because of the danger that is part of their work. Did you notice in verse 3, Jesus sends them on their way. Not, he doesn't say, you might want to go. He says, you go. It's an imperative. Go your way. Behold, I am sending you out as lambs in the midst of wolves. The work that Christ calls them to, it's not safe work. It's dangerous work. Jesus knows the kind of work that he is uh, calling them to do. It is as if the disciples are the sheep and those they are calling are the wolves. And so the disciples are going like prey to the hunters. The hunted are making it easier for the hunters. The, those who are weak are going to those who would devour them. It's dangerous work. I don't know if you've ever seen some of these nature shows where, where you have the hunter hunting the, well, for example, the orca hunt, hunts the, the cute little seal, right? And they're in the water. And the orca gets the seal and what sometimes the orca does is he begins to play with the seal. He doesn't eat him right away. 
He plays with a seal and he takes the seal and he throws him with his tail. Or you see it with lions who are, are hunting little wildebeest and they get the little wildebeest calf and they don't kill the wildebeest right away. In some of those instances, the, the little seal or the little wildebeest will, will go back to the prey after the, the orca slaps the, the, the seal you know, 20 feet in the air and the, the seal, instead of trying to get away, returns to the hunter. But there's always something so very ominous about that activity for that animal because you know what his fate will be. You know what that hunter will do with that little animal. At some point or another, he will crush this animal and devour it. Ultimately, the hunted is killed by the hunter. And that's what Jesus is identifying the disciples to be. A helpless lamb going among wolves, among those who would devour them. Jesus understands the danger of the work of the disciples in declaring his word. It's no surprise. There is no surprise, people of God, that of the 12 disciples, Christian tradition tells us only one of them died a natural death. The other 11 were di died at the hands of their oppressors in various ways, beheadings and crucifixions and burnings. The work of the disciple of Christ is dangerous work because the kingdom of light is invading the kingdom of darkness. And all throughout Scripture, we know one thing to be true about this relationship between the kingdom of light and the kingdom of darkness. It is marked by enmity. It is marked by a desire of the kingdom of darkness to utterly destroy those who come from the kingdom of of light. This is the reality of the work of the disciples. The serpent hates them. Satan wants to destroy them. And they go out as lambs among wolves. Jesus doesn't send them out in strength and great power. He sends them out very vulnerable. He sends them out as those who are defenseless. Their weakness is, and is accentuated by how Jesus sends them out. You see this in, in, uh, in, in verse uh, 4. No money bag, no knapsack to carry supplies, no, no extra pair of sandals in case these wear out. This, job, this task that you are engaging in is, on, is an urgent business. Don't greet people as you're walking. Don't stop and, and make small talk. This is a dangerous, urgent work for which you are completely unable to supply the needs. You go in the power of the Lord. You go serving the Lord of the harvest. And when you come to the people that you will meet, some will have the peace of Christ have the, at rest on them, and others will reject what you say. The acceptance or rejection seems to be insignificant to the work of the 72. It simply is recorded as a fact. It's not important whether or not they will receive or reject. There is simply an a, a acknowledgement that some will receive and some will reject. They are simply to go. They are simply to go completely dependent on the Lord for provision and for safety. And in verse 9, Jesus tells them what they are to do. They are to heal the sick, and they are to say to them that the kingdom of God has come uh, near to them. There is this simple message that Jesus sends them along. The words that the kingdom of God is near have been, are going to be reinforced by the miracles and the healings. Now, it's very likely that this is a truncated version of what they said. It's not likely that the disciples went out and simply said to everybody that they ran into, the kingdom of God has come near to you. And that's all they said to them. 
there is a recognition that there is a, a greater message, and, and sometimes Scripture simply condenses it for the sake of brevity. So, for example, you see the same message recorded in a little bit more clarity in, in Mark chapter 1 and verse 15, where Jesus begins his ministry, and he begins by saying the kingdom of God is at hand, or the kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the gospel. Repent and believe the good news that the Son of God has entered the world to die for the sins of His people. But this is the essential message of Christ. This essential message of, of repentance and, and belief. This repentance and, and faith that Jesus declared from the beginning of His ministry. Repentance dealing with an understanding of man. Essential for salvation. To repent means to recognize your sin and, and your shortcomings and how odious your wrongdoings and, and transgressions are in the sight of God. You have to know this, people of God. You have to know this about yourself. You have to know that you must repent. But if all you have is an awareness of your sin, you will be a puddle on the ground because you will recognize your worthlessness. And so there also must be accompanying this repentance, this belief in the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ that, that there is nothing that you can do to pay for these sins. It's not possible. But somebody has come to make it possible. This is the good news. Christ has come to die for you even while you were a sinner. Isn't that what Romans 5 teaches us? That when we come into the presence of God by faith and in the repentance that He has worked in us, that we will be cleansed. That's good news. That is what's to be declared by the disciples. Our confession of faith speaks of repentance uh, in this way also, this centrality of repentance to the message of salvation. It says in the 15th chapter of our confession, it says, Repentance is to be preached by every minister of the gospel as well as that of faith in Christ. The confession is simply mirroring what Jesus is telling his disciples to say. Faith and repentance. Belief and repentance. It is the central, essential message of the gospel. And the laborers are to go into the harvest as lambs, setting this message before the people. In, this, in essence, they are saying to the people, you must recognize yourself as a sinner, and Christ as the solution to your sin problem. In, in the church today, this, this message goes out in various degrees of, of strength. More often than not, unfortunately, there is either no message like this going out or, or a very weak message. And I'm not reading into anybody's motives. I'm simply observing a fact. I think many people are actually well-intentioned and and, and recognize the desire and the need for the sharing of this gospel. But sometimes the church has no message. It has no message that goes out because there is a fear of witnessing, or there is an apathy about the lost, or in some cases there is an imbalanced view of the sovereignty of God and, and the predestination that He works in the souls of men. But even the best-intentioned person who has no message, who uh, refuses to go out as a laborer, in the vineyard, goes, uh, stays at home because there is a lack of love for the unbeliever. They would not express it that way, but there is a lack of love for the unbeliever. Sometimes it's hard for us to be able to process this when we're thinking about the salvation of people. But let me try to put it in a circumstance that we can relate to, a circumstance that we can imagine in our own minds and, and see how no message actually shows a, a lack of love for people. When we lived in Canada, there was a, a major highway that went north. And one time, there was a major pileup on this highway. There was a dense fog caused by snow and the rising temperatures. And, and visibility on this road was, was next to nothing, very close to zero. And there was an accident at one point on this highway. Two cars bumped into each other because cars are traveling at 70 miles an hour. You do that still in Canada in the snow because you need to get to work and it's just snow. It doesn't matter. I can't see anything. There's snow on the ground, but I'm going to keep driving. And people are driving at 70 miles an hour and you have this accident. 
And because the visibility is so small, the accident gets larger and larger. And trucks begin to catch on fire and cars smash into each other as people see the pile up too late and, and, and people traveling the other way. They have passed this wreck. They know that this wreck is here. They know that, the, that, that there are people heading to their doom as they see them flying by at 70 miles an hour. Now the church that has no message says, I have no idea how to help these people, so I'm not going to do anything. Or the church that has no message says, well, it's not my problem. I'm heading the opposite direction, so I don't need to do anything to help them. Or the church with mo no message says, well, God is sovereign. If he wants them to stop, they'll stop. But God calls his people to go out into the harvest to declare, repent, and believe, to shout from the median between the two highways, there is doom up ahead. And you are headed straight for it. Other churches will have a a weak message, a weak, weak message that flows from a, a failure to recognize the need of the people in their condition. They'll say something like, you just need to befriend them. You just need to show them the love of Christ. No, no, beloved of Christ. These people don't need to know that they are okay. They need to know that there's a wreck. They need to know that there is doom and disaster. They need to know it. And they need to hear it from us. We are as laborers sent out into the harvest to say to people, repent and believe the gospel. And we need to do that in a, in a loving way. We need to do that in a, in a caring way. But that message has to be told. The final results of telling that message, of course, are not guaranteed for us. We never know whether or not a person will hear the words of the Lord or not. It's not our business. If the disciples declare the presence of the kingdom of God, they, they, the people who they declaring it to are, are quite likely to reject it. And Jesus acknowledges that when he sends them out. He says, but whenever you enter a town and they do not receive you. Jesus knows that when they go to these towns, people will reject them. The Spirit may not move in these people at this time. Their hearts may be hardened. The wolves may do what wolves do, right? The wolves may devour the lambs. And the disciples then are to move on to another place. They're not to stand in front of those people and badger them into the kingdom of heaven, talk to them long enough until they say, okay, fine, I'll be a Christian, just leave me alone. It's not the work of the ministry of the church. The people might reject. And so they are to shake off their dust as one final warning. One final warning. If you reject this, you are rejected by God. The disciples' work is to proclaim. The rejection of the proclamation is simply indicative of the severity of future judgment that belongs to those who would reject now, what's our re <clears throat> reaction to this rejection? It's going to come. Well, we can learn from our Lord Jesus Christ in his mourning over this rejection in verses 13 through 16. Jesus responds to this rejection, and he doesn't respond with a shrug. He responds with a lament, and not just a little lament, a strong lament. That word woe doesn't mean, oh, that's unfortunate. Oh, I stubbed my toe. Isn't that inconvenient? This is a, a strong cry, a strong expression of grief. It's like in the Old English how we would say, alas, right? This is the word of Christ about the rejection of the gospel. He pronounces this woe over Chorazin and Bethsaida and Capernaum. What kind of cities are those cities? Those are cities in Israel. Those are cities that belong to the covenant people of God. The people of Israel live in these cities. And Jesus 
knows already that they have rejected him. You notice that in the words? Uh, if the mighty works had been done in you, they would have repented. The mighty works have been done in Capernaum. They have been done in Chorus, and They have been done in Bethsaida. And these people have not repented. These people have rejected. If the pagan, if the pagan had seen these works, O Capernaum, they would have repented. They would have put on sackcloth and ashes. They would have been like Jonah's Nineveh. Jonah sent not to the people of God, but sent to the Assyrians, this wicked people who later would carry the people of Israel into exile, and they hear his words of calling them to repentance, and they, they repent. The king repents. His court repents. The commoners repent. The animals repent. This is the woe that is belonging to the cities of Israel. Israel's cities will not repent, and so their judgment is more severe. A city in the kingdom of Israel is not necessarily a city in the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is near to them, but it is entered by the gate of faith, and it results in the work of repentance. To hear the call of the, uh, the word of God by the mouth of his labors, Jesus says, is to hear the very call of Christ himself, to hear the very call of the Father, and to reject the call of Christ's labors is to reject Christ, it's to reject the Father. That's eternal consequences that are tacked on to that. Have you thought of that? To have the God of all glory and majesty uh, look down from heaven and speak to you through his messengers, and you say, no, thank you, God, I don't want your word. As a finite creature, you've just spat upon the eternal God who made you. This is the woe that Christ knows to be true of those who reject the gospel. Now, when we come to the rejection of the gospel, sometimes we say, it's not working. Uh, the work of God is not accomplishing its purposes through his disciples. But I want us to think through uh, that the expression of woe and the rejection of the gospel from the perspective of the word of God and what it accomplishes. In Isaiah chapter 55 and verses 10 and 11, it speaks to us of the mission and work of God's word. It says, For as the rain and snow come down from heaven and do not return there but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, and giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose, and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. When God's word goes out, and it is rejected, that is the purpose of, for which God sent out that word to that person. When the word of God goes out and it is accepted because the Spirit is at work in that person, the word is bearing fruit according to God's will in that person. The word going out always produces the fruit desired by God. That's why you can have the work of sorting. That's why the laborers can go out to the harvest. They will either be gathering wheat or they will be gathering tares. There is this sorting, this separation of people. It always accomplishes its purpose. Then finally, we see Jesus' warning to his disciples. The 72 return. It doesn't say how long they were gone, but they return with joy. And they're all excited. They've seen amazing things done by God's power at work in them. They have witnessed uh, demons being thrown out, and, and, and they came face to face, perhaps in fear, and when they spoke in Jesus' name, these, these demons fled. Can you imagine that kind of power? If, if you were given that power to exercise it between services, would you come back to the evening service and have some stories to tell? Would that be exciting? It's amazing that these disciples, when they come back, they don't mention anything about whether or not people had repented or not. 
They don't mention anything about whether or not somebody had been rescued from eternal condemnation. The message, that message, is, is primary. But it seems like the disciples are focusing on, on their works in the process. And we ought not to throw stones at the disciples for that. We're like that ourselves. Jesus, in dealing with his disciples, he's, he's so gentle with them, isn't he? In verses 18 and 19, he, he kind of acknowledges their power. You know, he's, he, he recognizes that, that their work was was effective in bringing Satan to his knees. I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Verse 18. I've given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions. That's not literal serpents and scorpions. That's the destructive power. Satan is the serpent. I've given you authority to tread on these things. You are uh, given this power by my hand. The sheep, the sheep were protected from the wolves. The wolves could not devour them because the Lord of the harvest had protected them. However, Jesus does bring them back to the main point, doesn't he? In verse 20, Do not rejoice in that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. The displays of the power of Christ are not the final goal. The final goal is the, either the rejection or the presence of a soul in, in heaven. God can establish His power through anyone. Think of Balaam, that, that false prophet from, uh, hired by Balak, the king of Moab, to curse Israel. And he comes, and what's the only thing that he can do? This pagan priest who later works to destroy Israel and is killed in battle against Israel. He sees Israel and he, he blesses her. That's all he can do. This mouthpiece of God, Pharaoh, before the Exodus, he is used for the glory of God, negatively, to be sure. But here God takes this mighty ruler, the strongest man in the world, and he destroys them, brings them to his knees, so that he has no choice but to set his people free and ends up perishing in the Red Sea. Caiaphas, the high priest, he prophesies, that it's better for one man to perish than the whole nation to suffer. These men can be used for God's glory. He doesn't need anybody special for that. He can use anybody. The goal is for your name to be written in heaven. The goal is for your name to be written in heaven. So as you labor in the vineyard, you declare the gospel. This dangerous and urgent work commanded by Christ always bears fruit. And what he leaves us with today is a reality check. What kind of fruit is being born in your heart? Is it the fruit of faith and repentance or is it the fruit of rejection? So that means several things. That means uh, we as God's people must be concerned about the gospel. In our Sunday school class this morning, we talked a little bit about how many people are unregenerate. And we can think about our own nation, depending on which poll you listen to. 70% of Americans say that they're Christian. I think that's grossly optimistic, personally. But that means that even if 70% of our nation is Christian, that means that there are 100 million souls in this nation that are bound for hell. That number is staggering. But then you think of the world. The world has 7 billion people living in it on this planet. Of those, 2 billion identify themselves as Christian. And we'll just take their profession at face value. That means that 5 billion people alive right now are headed to eternal destruction. Now that can be an overwhelming number. And not everybody in the church is called to give to missions as much as others can. Not everybody in this church is called to be an evangelist going door to door or standing on the street corner to declare the truth of God's word. But let me ask you this, people of God. Do your friends know about faith and repentance? Does your family know 
that they need to repent and believe. Parents, are you teaching your children the gospel? Are you setting before them the desperate condition that every person is in? Or are you counting on osmosis to do that work for you? You need to be concerned with the gospel. Do your friends, do your acquaintances know that they need to repent? Do you love them enough to tell them? There's not a one-size-fits-all on how you tell them and why you tell them and when you tell them. But are you telling the people around you? Or, at the very least, are you praying for the success of the spread of the gospel? No matter what your talents may be, no matter what gifts God has given to you, you can pray for the success of the gospel. I think the second thing we learn from this passage is that we should not try to look like the wolves. Jesus' response to the apathy of Capernaum is grief, and it's a warning in the woe statements. They maybe belong to the people of God, but nothing in them reflects the people of God. They may be part of the covenant family, but nothing in them reflects God's presence. I wonder what Christ would say about the North American church. I wonder what Christ would say about Cliffwood Presbyterian Church. What sort of lamp do we have? Do we tell people they need to repent? Do we care about transgressions against the Lord? Do we declare Christ as the solution to man's guilt? Or do we give them short-term self-improvement lessons? Are we happy when they're happy? Are we happy when we can converse with them about SEC college football and have some laughs together? Or do we want them to be in the kingdom of heaven? We speak the word in weakness. We are vulnerable when we speak it. We speak it with the potential of great cost to ourselves. We are lambs among wolves. We should not pretend to be wolves among wolves. And then finally, I think there's a, a real awareness for each of us individually as people gathered here in this service to be concerned with where your name is written. Every single person in these pews, I urge you, do not be content because you have grown up in the church. Do not be content because you've had Christian parents who have read you the Bible while you were growing up. Do not be content if you were called out of some great sin and have seen fruit in your life. Do not be content with those things but lay yourself before the mercy of God and say, Lord God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Be concerned with where your name is written. Don't be comfortable with the status quo. O Christian church, what will we do? Will we be praying to the Lord to send out laborers into his great harvest? Do we care about those whose name will go down into Hades like the city of Capernaum? Do we care whether or not our name is written in heaven? Do you care about whether or not those around you have their name written in heaven? We should pray. We should pray to the Lord of the harvest. We should go out in His strength. And we should depend on him as we declare to the world, repent and believe the gospel. Let's pray. Almighty God, we thank you for your mercy.